Welcome everyone to Black Arts. We tell your stories, will you preserve and tell ours? It's an important uh, session we're having today. My name is Jeffrey C. Stewart, and joining me today are Alice Randall, a best-selling author whose uh, recent book, A Black Bottom, has been published to rave reviews, and who, of course, is known for her earlier book in 2000, I guess 2001, uh, The Wind Done Gone. We also have joining us Edwige Danticat, Haitian-born uh, writer who is a uh, MacArthur Genius Award winner, whose book Breath, Eyes, and Memory uh, is one of the most important uh, books in what could be called Haitian Afro-diaspora literature of recent time. And, and finally, we're very pleased to have Tracy K. Smith, who served as the Poet Laureate of the United States uh, from 2017 to 2019, is author of many books, uh, poetry. Uh, her 2011 volume, Life on Mars, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize. So we're just so pleased to have this spectacular panel of writers with us today to explore our theme, which is the role of history in literature, and particularly how literature uh, activates uh, a sense of historical consciousness, especially among African Americans, and of course, more broadly, people from the African American diaspora. What role does literary arts play in preserving our heritage, in activating it, in making our consciousness of who we are and where we came from alive in our times. So we're just so happy to be able to engage, I think in a very timely discussion, uh, when we sort of feel like we're living through moments of history. How do we look back now as we feel like we need to look forward into the 21st century? So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, Alice Randall, perhaps I could start with you and just, uh, you know, you're the author of uh, book, The Wind Ungone, which is, in my opinion, uh, a critical uh, text as well as a imaginary, imaginative text. It engages with the canon, the American literary canon, in a very particular way. Uh, of course, you also have just recently published a uh, book, uh, Black Bottom Saints, uh, which explores uh, Detroit. It's kind of interesting. You have a 19th century a slavery in the South, and then you have a book on the 20th century uh, urban America in the North. Uh, could you talk a little bit about these books and is there any kind of conversation between these books that uh, led you to do one and then the other? Thank you, Jeffrey. And first, let me just say that I am thrilled to be on the panel with these three people that I'm with. I teach very specifically, Jeffrey, and Edwige's work, and my daughter te teaches Tracy, all at Vanderbilt. And so the, I am with some stars. And uh, in fact, for uh, Tracy, I will lift up, uh, Robert Hayden is the first saint in Black Bottom Saints, and he was the first Black <laughs> Poet Laureate of the United States. And I'm talking to you from Fisk University, where he was long on the faculty. And of course, he also then spent some time in Michigan, and I was born in Detroit. But you asked me about when Don gone, and, you know, I think about this, starting this conversation about history and artists, that I want to note that When Don Gone rose out of my experience of being a Black child reader in Washington, D.C. Before I became a writing Black woman, I was a Black child reader, and I picked up Gone with the Wind from a public library shelf when I wasn't quite 13 in my neighborhood library. And I took that book home and preteen me was shocked by the relentless use of the N word, shocked by the glorification of the Ku Klux Klan and a literal murderous Klan raid. Later, someone said my novel, The Wind on Gone was a literary equivalent of Prissy slapping Scarlet back. Yes. And I loved that the same way I love that you noted it is a work of literary criticism. I knew Pamela and Shamala Fielding wrote a novel to critique his friend Richardson's novel. And I did something of the same thing, though that wasn't always recognized. But more than Prissy slapping Scarlet back, I wanted to sign 
to something Malcolm X had written in his autobiography that had gone so long unnoticed, that watching Gone with the Wind had shamed him. And when a federal judge stopped the presses on my novel, he wrote Miss Mitchell's beloved characters as if they were universally beloved. Until I wrote The Wind on Gone and got it published despite opposition of the Mitchell estate, including a $10 million suit, generations of individual black readers' responses to Gone with the Wind were erased and in, ignored in order to preserve both the myth of the Old South and a myth that this one book was a universally beloved American classic. The Wind on Gone was a new kind of testimony, fictional witness, that at least one black woman hated the book. A subject for when Don Gong is the inner life of thousands of black people, including my own grandmother who could not read enough, had to have the book read aloud to her. Wow. Who read Gone with the Wind, were damaged by it, read Gone with the Wind and were repelled by it, read Gone with the Wind and called it out as a lie every night my grandmother spent in bed with her near white colored, black man husband, she knew Gone with the Wind was a lie. They were disgusted by Prissy's feigning competence when she had none. My Prissy feigns incompetence as she competently reaches her goal of vindicating her brother's murder. My fifth novel, Black Bottom Saints, is a novel that took me, I like to say, 50 years of living and four earlier novels to get to. It too is witness to 50 years of my immersion and celebration and being sustained by a variety of black arts. It is Ziggy's story. Ziggy is a black journalist and MC at two clubs, The Flame and The 20 Grand. He's the founder of a citizenship school that masquerades as a dance school. The Ziggy Johnson School of the Theater, it's told in as a Saints Day book. But it's, and it's set in a time in Ziggy's favorite neighborhood, Detroit in the mid-century, when Black Bottom is an epicenter of Black art, activism, athletics, and industry. But it's not just about the makers, the creators, the bold best names. It's got Robert Hayden and Ethel Waters. It's very much a celebration of the power of the Black audience, the power of a particular Black audience, the Black Bottom audience, comprised largely of automobile workers who when they got off the assembly line were eager to engage with black music, black painting, photography, poetry, music, dance, theater, and even cocktails created by black hands and offered as expressive art. And the doctors, lawyers, policy bankers, hairdressers, and everybody else who lived off those workers Ziggy called the breadwinners. Whereas the wind on gone celebrates a singular perspective of individual Black people. Black Bottom Saints is literally written from 61 different perspectives and celebrates the complexities and variations of Black audience and community. And of a particular community, the Black Bottom, that understood a central part of its identity to be its appreciation of Black art as measured by a particular Black aesthetic and rooted in Black Bottom. So I went from the art that hurt me to the art that sustained me. And that's how I got from When Done Gone to Black Bottom Saints. Wow, that's an incredible story. I mean, but I guess before I even deal with that, the fact that you were sued for writing a novel seems to me to be an astounding fact. I mean, that's a, a part of our history that for, us to write the stories from our perspectives, we have to be sued. I mean, in a nation that is constantly bombarding us with the, the so-called reality of the First Amendment, freedom of speech, and all sorts of manner of, uh, of shenanigans masquerade as speech, and here you are writing something. What was the basis, if you don't mind me asking, of their suing you for writing a, a work of fiction? One, they said it was a sequel. And I said, you could write a sequel to Gone with the Wind from a Black perspective, and all the Black people would be dumb and ugly, and all the white people would be powerful. But that is not, and I said, we could call that Uncle Tom Goes to Tara. That is not what I wrote. In right. my book, the Black people were brilliant, and they were beautiful. And there were a couple of white allies that helped them, almost all of whom were gay. 
that's the book I wrote. Right. I said, what I made of the scar, when that read that book, it hurt me. And what I made of that scar was my very own. But wow. in fact, they did sue me. And the first judge literally put an injunction, stop the presses. And he said, you, may, you killed Miss Scarlett and re married Rhett off to a stranger. Wow. The poets and other writers, that stranger, I think there's another word he wanted to say there. Mm -hmm. Right. Kill right. Miss Scarlet. And I said, no, they are actually fictional characters. I actually know that. You may yeah. not know that, but I know that. And I have created my own fictional character, a character that was excluded from the pages of Gone with the Wind, literally a mulatto woman. Scarlet. So in order for you to tell your story or your your view of this, you had to disrupt their story, and they didn't like that. They did not like their story being challenged. They did not want to coexist in this wonderful world in which we all live, where there are multiple meanings of singular texts and lives and circumstances. And also theirs was literally the original story. And I don't want to go too far into this, but Gone with the Wind, there are no mulattoes on all of Tara. Right. Which I this think is, is a key not thing you talk about. What, where are all the mixed race people on at, you know, on, on, the, on the plantation, because we know that that's always going to be the case. And what's even other interesting part there is so much of what we know of what is appealing about Scarlet are qualities that actually belong to black women in that period. I mean, that's a whole yeah. other discussion that, um, right. but fortunately um, we were silent. The presses were stopped and then the presses were started again. And the things, the readers that I have treasured the most for that book were the readers who told me that they were domestic servants who worked in houses where someone still loved Gone with the Wind and how it had pained the women they worked for to see me on some of these morning shows and how they loved this book and that I got to have the say that they didn't feel they could have until uh -huh. they were empowered. And to me, wow. no, my grandparents couldn't, my grandfather couldn't read or write at all. I write for people who read books and I write for people who have to have books read aloud to them. Wow, that's fantastic. And we, you know, I, it, you, you, this issue of literacy is very much a part, I think, of your story that you're telling because in that, uh, the central character's uh, aunt can't read and uh, you know, is, is, is marginalized in that. And I just wanted if you would talk a little bit about uh, this issue of literacy, you know, how, how there's a kind of Haitian literacy uh, that's border crossing, that's French, but it's more than French. And your story is really about someone who crosses the border between Haiti and, and in Port-au-Prince and New York and she's a, 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 a transformative figure, but also someone who is also acting for those who can't read. And I, I, just, I, I just wondered if, if in writing this story, were there particular people in your background who you knew who couldn't read and, and that this was one of the, the issues underlying this story as well? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, I also want to echo that it's really wonderful to be here with, with all of you. Um, I, so I, you're referring to Breath Eye's memory. Um, yes, and sorry. The, and the, the aunt and the story is, um, first of all, a storyteller. And, and I always say to people who would say, you know, who taught you to write? I will always say it's the storytellers of my childhood. And and, and most of them, you know, like my, my grandmother did not read, did not know how to read, but could sure tell a story in a way that was intimidating to me because I wasn't that sort of perform, I couldn't perform a story the way my aunts and grandmothers could. And, and there was a connection between the storyteller and, the, and the, the audience, if you will, which was mostly children that was so powerful that if it seemed like, you know, it often happened at night and if you seemed like you were falling asleep or if you were bored, there was suddenly a song in the story, there was built in suspense. And, 
And you could hear the same story over and over, you know, for, for years. And, and it's told differently every single time. So for me, that was a really powerful lesson and how people embody story and how it's almost like when you're given a story, it's a gift and it's yours to give in a different way. So I, I've always thought of myself as a kind of accident of literacy. So we're, we're having, you know, the, those stories met with having gone to school and then reading another kind of story. And I would sit there and listen to these stories being told. And I knew that I would never be able to do that performance element of it. But when, when I started reading, I thought, oh, this is another way to do it. And the, like the sort of one-on-one -on -one intimacy that, that is born out of a reader meeting a book. Yeah, I mean, it seems as if you also are saying that this storytelling is a bond, but also a source of tension between mother and daughter, right? I mean, that, that you know, we have stories often in our family, some of which we don't want to have told. And, uh, you, you know, your, your central character is relentless in pursuing these stories. And I just wondered if that kind of pursuit of truth, personal truth, has a broader sense about Haiti and the way in which Haiti is thought about. I mean, your, your, your book seems to have a way of representing the history of Haiti to Americans who usually have a variety of stereotyped ideas about Haiti, the history of Haiti, and also the contemporary importance of Haiti, which is largely, from my sense, you know, removed from the the, the public media in the United States. I well, just I'm, wonder, I'm, when you think about it, do you see yourself as kind of a representative or a, 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 a in the same ways in which I think Alice was talking about it, you, you're representing, you're bearing a, a, a history that is, is covered up in the American mind. Well, I, I think of myself as maybe one of you know, thousands of representatives. I think it's, it would be sort of dangerous for, for me to say, I'm the one, it's me. <laughs> right, I know, I didn't um, know yeah. <laughs> um, But uh, that's, and I, I always figure in, I think, because also in my family, you know, people gradually arrive here. And there's also a part of our story that involves America coming to us in many of the different invasions, but this very long, U.S. occupation um, from 1915 to 1934, in which we still have remnants of certain things. So, uh, and that weaving of those, you know, of, of I'm telling that story, um, not just to Americans, but also to my nieces and nephews who were born here, or so like that generation in between. So for me, that, that also factors into it so that this sort of understand like the whole line uh, the lineage of their stories and you know the role that Haiti has played in the, the world with the Haitian revolution which is less off less often brought up by people who may not know than sort of recent um, things and you know that that recent events that then they they sort of use um, to to demean us a certain you know stigmatization a certain way so I think though it's you have to tell the, the full story and, and I always imagine that I'm, I'm telling it to people who are interested, that I'm telling it to sort of, and, and, you know, among ourselves, which is, you know, that I'm telling it to my nieces and my nephews too. Um, and that makes it a little bit sort of like less having to represent because there, there's so many uh, different experiences. And as the generations, you know, the younger people who, who are younger than me will have a different story to tell. But I think that's, that's, so the story of migration, it's always evolving. Um, and the type of migration that happened, say, in the past four years will be very different than, than like what the Im immigrant experience was, let's say, eight years ago or something that's always, that's always changing. Yeah, so the, the, the typical migration, immigration story from an American perspective is always how bad it is someplace else, right? And then people come here and then they're, they become Americans and everything's fine, right? And you really problematize that. I mean, you really uh, show that coming to New York is not uh, the deliverance 
And the other thing I think is really strong about your work is it, even though you really uh, do a lot about tradition, you don't romanticize tradition. I mean, you interrogate traditions and, and show that some of these traditions need to be repudiated, right? I mean, so that, that's that critical role that I was mentioning with uh, Alice, you, you're carrying that out too with the Haitian tradition. Well, I think I really liked what Alice said about the art that hurts you and the art that uh, nourishes you. And I think yes. there's always a balance of that in every tradition. And through the generations, um, you know, we, it, we sort of re revisit um, different things. And, and often I think I kind of got in a, a sort of hot water there with when you present, like when the tradition there is read, like the way we present certain things and from our experiences, you know, whether the African-American experience or the African diaspora experience, is that sometimes we, what we present as a family tradition is read as like anthropologically, right? Like all Haitians do this or, and that in a way is something that also is, uh, is to be questioned along as someone, along with the self-interrogation that a character or a writer might be doing. Yes. Well, well Tracy, I, I'm so glad to, to have you here and, and to participate in this because when I think about poetry often, I really think about the issue of form. And while it's certainly the case that, you know, we're representing history, we're also creating forms to go with that history. I mean, in other words, we, uh, everyone on this panel, uh, you writers essentially are creating new literary forms for the history. And I just wondered as a poet, thinking about form and engaging with it, what sort of led you to kind of adopt the, the kind of form that you had with, uh, with, with Life on Mars and, 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 and play with form at the same time of telling really personal histories, like you know the relationship with your father. Um, so that literature is not just simply another form of history, it's a new form of history. And I think that's what, 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 what this panel really epitomizes, a new way of telling history uh, through literature. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the, the path of becoming a poet and, 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 and working with form to tell these personal uh, and, and broader histories that you tell in, in, in your book. Yeah, um, well, I also wanna just reiterate how uh, grateful I and honored I am to be here on this panel with writers whose work I revere. Um, sitting here listening has been also just so enriching. So thank you for your thoughts. Um, I started reading and writing poetry because poems in their attention taught me how to pay greater attention to the world as I experienced it. Poems taught me to look closely at small things or to look with new eyes at that which was familiar um, so that I could learn something from it. I started writing poems at you know age 20 um, when I needed help living. I needed to find a way of claiming some form of authority um, and finding not just a writerly voice, but a human voice. Who am I? What do I belong to? Um, what mark do I seek to leave here? Poems um, helped me to do that because they showed me how other writers um, met those kinds of needs in their own work. I think that What's exciting to me about um, what poetry does, but really literature, is it creates um, form or, or space for that which is unsettling or even sometimes unbearable to be named and parsed. And I feel like I hear that in both of the, the narratives that Alice and Edwige have shared about their own work. There's something in the world that bears examination, um, correction, expansion, and we've got to find a way in language to do that kind of work. Um, in a poem, you see that form very literally as lines sit on the page and as white space 
operates to kind of conduct the reader through the text. Um, what I understand from my own process is that those choices are a way of bracing myself against the material, emboldening myself to move through um, with the proper kind of focus, reverence, courage, and inquiry. Um, the other thing that is always so exciting to me about working with language in this way is that I don't know, and I like to believe that many writers don't know where they're going, only that there's the need to move with attention through something. Form creates certain kinds of possibilities or even inevitabilities, depending upon how rigid that form is. So if I'm writing, um, well, you mentioned Life on Mars, there's a sequence of elegies in that book to my father called The Speed of Belief. And um, at, when I wrote the book, I was dealing with grief as this large, messy, inescapable state and I would wake up and I would say, I miss my father. I need to revisit him in some way. I need to claim him or figure out where I wanna believe that he now is. It's hard to write a poem with something that big in your heart, but to say, I'll write a poem that obeys the rules of a terza rima. I'll write a sonnet, I'll write a guzzle so that there's a certain path my thoughts will be forced to take that's different from the path that they would take if I was just you know, left to my own devices. And what's really exciting to me about that is often, if you work hard, it can yield insight. Um, in that elegy, um, there's one moment where I was rem remembering my childhood, um, a child in the home where my father was definitely the head of the household in the traditional sense. And my heart didn't want to be critical of him and sitting down to write that poem, but rhyme forced me to acknowledge something that was dissonant with the kind of praise that we think of um, as suiting an elegy. And that felt real and that felt um, revelatory in a way. Um, form mm -hmm. guides us to those kinds of um, realizations, I think in ways that um, are probably a large part of why many of us write. Yeah, it's almost like that was that unexpected eruption of some new knowledge from grappling with that form uh, that you mentioned. And almost, it's interesting that everyone's work seems to be engaged with some form of catharsis, where we're, we're kind of coming to grips with loss and pain, but also the possibility of transcendence through loss and pain, which requires a certain courage. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate with the work that you've done. I had looked at your work, you know, I was aware of it, but then for this panel, I really spent much more time with it. And I just felt the courage to take on these issues, which are difficult issues. And as you're suggesting, Tracy, most often, we sort of don't really want to face them. But then in the case of that feeling for for your father, it came and found you. You know, it, it, it came and found you and it forced you to grapple with it. And in grappling with it, you came up with a way of honoring uh, that that experience as well as your as your father, which I think is really what, what literature does when it does things best. I wanted to just shift here and maybe give each of you a chance because this is such a unique kind of coming together to maybe ask one another uh, a, a question or uh, because this is a kind of an opportunity uh, for that. And maybe we'll go the opposite way and maybe start with Tracy. Uh, uh, do, do you have a question for one of the other guests here who uh, that you might wanna ask? I do, I have a question for both or if, if either of you wish to answer. Um, I've been thinking a lot during this period of isolation, um, intense um, reckoning in terms of racial justice, but also in terms of so many other, um, the crises that we're living through. I found that my own sense of mission as a writer, my own relationship to the material that um, I have been committed to and that I, that I, I want to deepen my engagement with is changing. Um, I feel myself 
in, in a way that is, um, I'm almost observing it happen, defining a new form of allegiance in terms of the community that I, I, I want to speak to and listen for, gather around. And I want to know what, um, what is happening with um, your sense of mission or purpose. Um, is it, is it um, changing at all as a result of the world and all the changes that are upon us? Is there anything that you're rethinking or do you find that your um, kind of the vision that you've, you've um, claimed is being refined in any way? What a, what a fabulous question. Um, I, I find that I, and, and it's not something that I express in my everyday life because I have young children, but I find that I live with this sense of precarity that I didn't have before. And, and I really, I, I feel a, a sense of urgency about documenting the moment I live in. So what I've, I've mostly been writing nonfiction and, and I, and I, I'm so aware in a way that I was never before that I, that like, I mean, it sounds really like sad in a way, but that, you know, just like, oh, this could be possibly like the last things I write, I better make it count. And, um, and it's something that just hovers all the time. And so I find myself wanting to more, for example, tell the stories of people in my community, how they're coping. For example, we had, we had a neighbor who passed away who was actually, you know, she was here the night my mother died in, my, in this house. And when my kids were born, but when she died, we couldn't even go near her door during the pandemic. So I, I find myself wanting to document things like that to really have a a record of this time. So I, I'm writing more in that sense. And um, of course, there's like other work that is in the, the background, you know, the novel that I want to get back to, but I find a, a, a different sense of urgency about more like what James Baldwin called witnessing, like being a witness. I do think it's a oh, powerful question. Um, the word I would have used is the word that we just used is urgency. I also think I'm 61 years old and uh, I think of this in many ways as a time and I think both of old heads and new voices and I very much have a sense of myself as an old head. I think each of you may be new voices and old heads but I am very much interested um, in the distilled wisdom and also these very new voices and how we collaborate together to have the greatest power because um, my teaching I'm more passionate about now than I've ever been because we've never seen, there's been um, an attack in this country on science, on intellectualism, on insight, on thinking. And so I think that as an educator of all people that I, that's something that's passion, that's part of the political work right now is to actually educate. I also feel in terms of songs, poems, novels, even digital art collections in the isolation. I'm two years out of a breast cancer diagnosis. So I've literally been out of my house maybe eight times since March 10th. And most of that was doctor's appointments. I've only eaten with one person, which is my own daughter since March 10th and once with a friend of hers at a distance. What I've had with me and what other people are having throughout this country is art, is music, is movies. Art will come in. That's what you have in the, your hardest, darkest hours. It's what you may have literally in a foxhole is that the poems you remembered in your head. Fortunately, I had those great, that I knew that from a childhood hour and memorized lots of poetry. I said, I literally, I'm in an apartment, a tiny apartment with 30, 40 books. I'd reach as one of them. That, but I have so much art in my head and then access to it on the internet. So I've never felt some you know, YouTube clips, some of these new memes, sharing ideas about what movie to watch, because that may help you get together. Anxiety and depression are stalking our communities of black women right now in COVID. 
I say every day, joy is radical. Mm -hmm. And joy in our world and my world is hard won. Yeah. So we build it. I say you make sand like you make a bed every day. It doesn't <laughs> gotta get up and build it. But what helps people build sand every day is this the story, the nat the storytelling in the community the storytelling that we're sending out, the poems, the art, the music, the TV shows that work, high and low, it's art. Mm -hmm. And so I have never felt that art, as well as witness, but art, because it bends towards the ideal and the magical. This world is so inadequate to us in so many ways right now. Yeah. It's not yeah, just witnessing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I will. I was just oh. going to say that speaking of forms, um, I feel more and more emphatically that the world we inhabit is a form that's been created to contain and constrain us and, and the diaspora that we belong to. And I, I feel a, a fierce determination to use my art to undo that to the extent that I'm capable of. And I'm hearing the work that I've read and, and been nourished by for, for decades in a different way. It feels new and ongoing and I'm understanding, oh, um, Gwendolyn Brooks made a choice. She turned her attention inward to the black community and it wasn't formal. It was about serving this need. Um, I, I hear this happening in so many different artworks, um, almost as like they're speaking to us. I feel like, like we're in the midst of a gathering of the generations. Mm -hmm. And if you're listening in the right way, there's an ongoing conversation, a dialogue, which is, um, I've believed that metaphorically as a reader and writer, but it feels literal to me now. It's wild that you say that. I've been thinking about her poem, The Bean Eater. We are at that table with those humble things. <laughs> Limited grammar, culinary grammar, and we are making some kind of beast. Uh, Alice, did you have a question? I mean, I have a number of them, but I, I, I really want to hear <laughs> if to you hear have a great sense of, 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 of the conversation going on among writers. I just want to create that well, space. I can, I can ask a question. I think that follows up on, on that because I feel like it's such a, an important conversation right now. How, how do you, Alice, you talked about your, the teaching what are the concrete ways we could we could do that? We can bring along that gathering, right? Is it in our relationships? Is it in how? What are what what are some actual things we can do? I feel like my teaching, um, you know, my teaching this semester, it's felt so much more intimate. You know, I'm teaching online. My students are in all different parts of. Um, the country and coming together in this form of community is really, um, it's, it's prized, it's a prized kind of moment in days that feel kind of ongoing and unchanging in a way. Um, I feel that I've been listening, trying to, to kind of listen to the conversations across works. I've been thinking um, through the works that I've taught um, about the ways that black writers, black poets, have taken the private lyric tradition and turned it into something that serves a larger collective, you know, a we. The I has kind of moved over and made space for a we. Um, and asking, asking questions out of that, that position, um, thinking about the ways that Lucille Clifton lives in Jericho Brown and why. Um, what is what is yet unresolved that she's you know attended to that now that now he's mm. um, working in the service of thinking in that way has felt useful to me and I think it it serves this larger question that I'm interested in. I think it's almost as a purposeful kind of continuity, right? Rather than it be accidental, but like I guess we go and look for it um, in some way. I have a question coming off of what you have both said is one, has there been any 
positive surprise, any gift in COVID of any sort. And two, Edward, you mentioned a death of a neighbor. And I will say that you know, what, I think that we're not getting to mark our dead during COVID very particular time. I call out right here in this conversation, Randall Keenan's name. I was very close mm -hmm. to Randall. So the trauma of losing him, but the trauma of not being able to honor his death in ways that would have happened in another time. So the two sides of either of those questions, the pull, what has been the positive surprise of COVID if there has been one for you? What is the death that you think that has gone unmarked in COVID? If you'd like to call out a name right now. So many, I mean, certainly Randall's, um, you know, for privacy, I, I don't wanna call out specific, but my heart calls out so many people who are friends of my parents. Um, and I agree that is that, I think that's when now the work becomes a kind of ritual of mourning because we were not able to mourn. Um, and I remember when some friends of my parents died and I was talking to their minister and he said, you know, we'll just have a big gathering when this is all over, whenever that is. And that lack of ritual, that lack of mourning, you know, not being able to sing, not being able to recite those Psalms. I think that that's also part of the weight we're going to carry when we emerge out of this. And, and then how do we mourn after that, right? How do we um, honor those dead? And, and the work is one way. And I was really struck by what Tracy was saying about shaping, giving shape to grief. And, and because it's so amorphous right now, it's, it's a quarter of a million people, each of them so crucial to someone. Um, so I think that will, will also be something we, we are dealing with as, you know, in our hearts, but also in, in that's the weight we will carry into whatever work we, we carry on next. Mm -hmm. I love that you use the word ritual um, because I feel like one of the gifts of this time has been um, a ritual, <laughs> has been uh, kind of a, an ongoing practice. Um, for me, it's been meditation. I would also say it's been prayer, but it's been something that has been directed at, I don't know, something like a two-way conversation, if that's possible. I've always thought my listening as a writer is about being receptive to the unconscious and, and whatever beyond the self exists. But this time, and it's, you know, the losses of COVID, it's the immense cruelty that I've um, witnessed and experienced that has to do with the dialogue around racism and anti-racism and the terror and the de uh, denial that that topic um, incites in certain spaces. And ritual has been a form of coping for me that um, I'm thinking about continuity, right? And community ancestry and, and somehow those spaces are also um, reached in that in that practice. That feels beautiful to me. Um, I understand how we have survived as long and as beautifully as we have. And a, a, and a gift has been that the pro like people have been able to come out and and those protests. Um, and I think in a way that they might not have if if we had not been shut in and you know that realization to really sit with with grief and then um and you see young people you know across generations reacting um to 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 especially the the murder of george floyd and brianna taylor and and, and i think we've had an opportunity to sit with with this grief too and and the first opportunity to react um and people we did I love, I think to me, George Floyd who died May 25th, if it had not been a nation sitting because of the nature of racism and the denial of racism, how vivid it is in America right now, I think he empowered himself. He told a one word story, mom. He called out his mama's name. Yeah. 
a wide swath of Americans understood fundamentally he was human and the person who would put his knee on his neck and let him die was not less than what a human being should be. He told his own story and not, he didn't save his own life, he died, but he probably saved so many lives to come. And those protests are probably the most important part of art that's being created and perform, they're not performance art, but they are art and they will be the great art of this time part of it. I also think in Detroit, where it's been so hard hit, the 900 people who died there and they created that ceremony, the images at Belle Isle, the pictures, that had something to do with all those people going to the polls mm -hmm. and the city of Detroit rising up in the middle of being hard, devastated by an epidemic and voting and standing in line and mailing and voting. Those 900 that morning, you know, when you talk about Tracy, deconstructing, they're deconstructing, dismantled something with those 900 public portraits that people could drive and see in their space, but also communally. Those portraits had something to do, not everything, but I think something to do with people rising up and Detroit women largely putting Michigan on its back and pointing it in a better, America in a better direction. I, just, I, mean, I think that's really powerful. There are other writers, it seems like the African-American literary tradition has always been one that was engaging the social, the contemporary, the historical, uh, rather than essentially art, which is sometimes seen as escape. And so I wondered when you thinking about this period of time and thinking about your own writing projects, are there any writers that you kind of can look to from the past who've kind of taken the times that they lived in and turned it into some form of powerful poetry or fiction or nonfiction? I mean, are there's a live tradition of writers who have engaged with the tragic present and, and made art and a new kind of history out of it. Are there any of those that, that come to mind to you individually as you kind of begin to think about, well, where am I gonna go from here? Anyone you look to or you might be reading now that you wouldn't have been reading before? Mm -hmm. Well, I've part of this time has been cleaving to people that I've, I'm always loving and reading. Like I mentioned, Lucille Clifton. Um, I've also been uh, revisiting writers who've taught me things and asking what they've taught me to to live in a different context. So Frederick Douglass, um, the narrative that life of the life um, has been in my heart on my bedside table, um, and thinking about that that vision of American. American democracy and freedom and equality is these literal goals that, um, you know, are still not met. Um, those, that voice feels so critical. Um, I'm reading um, Derek Walcott's Omeros right now and thinking about how, you know, the, the epic project of that, which is to think about classical history and myth and to recognize the ways that Black life lives and operates at that scale, to recognize the head game that's been played on us through histories of subjugation and um, oppression that makes one doubt that. Um, and then the beautiful work that that, 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 that that book does to move back and forth through history and to acclaim different forms of authority, to call out the self, for um, feeling less than or having having doubt, second guessing the impulse to say this is um, this is mythic. Um, I don't know. I feel that that's Im immeasurably useful um, because it reminds me of of the work that you know we were talking about. There are these practices that have sought to make smaller 
um, the, the history of Black people, the presence and contribution of Black people, and even the sense of self. Um, and art is one place where that can be reversed on an individual scale and in many different forms of collective scales as well. It's been really wonderful to see also, you know, I'm 51 now, so I can say younger, <laughs> to see all the wonderful work that's come out from, from younger writers, the, all the great story collections, the second novels. It's, it feels like there's a really powerful replenishing and the range of the, of the storytelling is so um, incredible. Um, but what I've read most recently was, uh, and Tazaki Shange has a, a, a book of where she interviews dancers. Um, and I think it's her, well, uh, you never know with Tazaki, there might be other books coming, but it's so, it's, I, I didn't realize I was missing her until I started reading her interviewing dancers and talking about this, you know, her foray into the world of dance and it's really a a, a beautiful she had a file of interviews with a, a whole range of dancers but it goes to what Alice was saying about joy um there's so much joy in that she in her interrogation of this world you know which she was half in and out of so it's um it's a it's kind of I, I found it very wonderful it felt like spending time with her and in this moment where we're so limited in who we can spend time with, I, 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 felt, I felt her, I just missed her. And I felt, there are people you think like, what would they make of this moment? And, um, and I feel like she would dance and... Um, I have been reading, um, I agree with um, Edwidge, I love the new things, including I had didn't had never until COVID, I'd never watched TikTok. I even like some of the, the expressive arts that are being created in very un in certain Instagram feeds, the way they are being curated by particularly black women, uh, certain TikTok things specific, but I've also liked non-traditional texts of I've been following in African American newspapers obituaries. And also mm -hmm. I really encourage people to look at now so many of the even smaller black historical newspapers have now been digitized and are often available through your library. Um, and I have been reading extensively, you know, just during, in 30s and 40s, week after week, immersing myself in individual towns and places mm -hmm. to see what I find there from the past. Um, you know, books are my addiction. I think I probably read five to six. It's, it's a drug that never lets me down. And so I read five to six books a week, probably, because it is my addiction. I'm alone in this place. Uh, so I get a chance to reread things. Even Zora Neale Hurston, when you think of that, it's a very intimate book. And when you think about Black lives, that we are both intimate, political, and public at the same time. People rarely read their eyes are watching God as a statement about environmental disaster, but it is, as a statement about how economic persecution puts you at environmental risk, or even about healthcare disparity, because who gets the rabies vaccines quickest? Mm -hmm. right. So those are all in that book. And I have thought about and what how much danger. How close will I get to somebody? Will I let my daughter breathe on me? How close did she get to tea cake? How close do you let the dog get to you? How much love balances with how much death? Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's powerful. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's, almost a, right that's and almost a metaphor of the whole thing. How much love you have for how much death? And uh, I think the, the art is often the way we negotiate that terrain, you know, because we have to, we can't escape death, but we often try to escape love. And the, the, the art kind of brings us back to confront that dualism. And uh, I'm just so, uh, so moved by the conversation that we've been having. And I want to take now and thank you for coming on and sharing uh, what you're going through as writers and what you have produced as writers and uh, people who've, on one way or another, 
created literature that tells our history. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. Uh, right now, I want to open up our discussion to uh, History Makers uh, Committee. Uh, we have some panelists and who are advising the history makers in the area of the arts. Uh, that uh, committee includes uh, Marie Brown, a literary agent, uh, magazine book editor, uh, Donald Byrd, choreographer, uh, Dennis Cohen, a comic artist and Milestone Media founder, Patricia Cruz, executive director of Harlem Stage, uh, Amina Dickerson, arts administrator and arts consultant, George Faison, the American Performing Arts Collaborative Incorporated co-founder, Joanne Gavin, uh, Furious Flower Poetry Conference founder and professor. I like that. Jerry Pinkney, uh, illustrator. Denise Saunders Thompson, president of the International Association of Blacks and Dance. Franklin Sermons, museum director of the Perez Art Museum in Miami. Sylvia Sprinkle Hamlin, arts administrator. And finally, Donald S. Sutton, arts administrator. I wanna open up this part of the program to those who are with us today. Uh, our first question, comes from Donald Sutton, uh, Arts Administrator. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, actually had su submitted a comment and uh, extending uh, my deep thanks to uh, uh, Ms. Dendicat for the outstanding endorsement that she's made of our most recent uh, issue, Dance We Do, uh, A Poet Explores uh, Black Dance by Antazaki Shange. Um, uh, my uh, bio is actually that I'm literary trustee of the Antizaki Shange estate, and we have recently released um, Antizaki's last work, a uh, posthumous book and commentary on dance, uh, in which uh, George Faison figures. George, are you there? <laughs> and uh, uh, quite a few other dancers, several of whom have, have come out of the woodwork, um, acknowledging the power of literature uh, to document and uh, preserve uh, our work. I think most of the comments that we've received uh, have been about the fact that there has been so little documentation of extremely important choreographers and creators in the dance field, uh, regardless of the impact that African-Americans uh, have had uh, on the dance form. Uh, I think if I had a, a, comp a, a question for the panelists, my, my. Uh, it would uh, be in the area of uh, your your distribution. That's the side of the business I spend most of my time in um, is actually marketing, uh, distribution, finding outlets, finding imprints. And I'm wondering uh, if in the last year you've seen anything in publishing similar to the response of uh, major media systems and the major uh, media networks. Um, uh, in terms of demand for African American work, and has that impacted you uh, at all? Um, you know, everything that's being adapted for television is is pretty much being bought. Um, uh, I'm wondering if that's having a an impact uh, on the rest of the publishing world. So um, I, I can just take a quick stab at it. Um, are you saying, in a sense, that perhaps in response to um, the COVID and also um, the murders, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, there's kind of a uptick in reaching out to African-American voices. Um, is, is that kind of the context of uh, your, your, your question, Donald? Yes, yeah, certainly. That's certainly that's a, uh, that's a part of it. Um, uh, I would think that anyone involved in literature would be aware now. And it certainly uh, extends uh, beyond the events of this year. This is, uh, these items that you mentioned are the, what they would call the proximate cause. Uh, these are the items that have kind of kicked, uh, kicked the bucket over. Uh, but um, uh, everybody that I know in Los Angeles is working. 
And um, what that suggests to me is that there has been a recognition in uh, corporate and commercial circles uh, of a, an African-American audience. Do you think it's a reading audience? And if not, how do we get there? I think that um, African-Americans are one of the largest reading audiences in America. And um, I think that presses are perhaps more motivated to accept and acknowledge that. I think it's a, it's a dawning realization that's been happening over time. Um, but maybe what we're also observing is a growing curiosity either out of you know earnest interest or the sense of dire need um, to pay greater attention to different, the various different stories that are coming out of um, our communities. Um, I don't have great insight into the larger part of your question because, you know, as a poet, most of what I do is to work quietly, and then, you know, there's there's a time when the work will come out. But I'm I'm rarely in a position of being asked to create content other than maybe <laughs> certain poems for things. Um, so I'd be curious if if um, Edwige and Alice have a different sense. It's funny that you said content. Like I I think there's just many more avenues now for things, there's all these streaming services. So there is, um, whenever people, like I don't, uh, I've not had my stuff adopted. I had some things option that didn't come through, but I'm always talking to people who are like, we need content, we need content. And, and you have a feeling that if you are able to bypass what you do and create some content that you might have a shot that's at, you know, either for podcast, for Hulu, for all these um, service, the different streaming services. So I think there's, there's more, and also there's more um, African-American and creators of color, right? There's, uh, there, there's just more avenues for material, but I, the content, that notion of this content is, is something I hear a lot about. It's almost like there's a, a beast to feed and, yeah. and that's with content and um, which will work, I think, to the advantage of, of, of creators um, across the spectrum, but uh, creators of color, certainly African-American um, cre creators, you know, you know, will get more, there'll be more opportunities for options and, and things of that nature. And I think, and, and we hope that more people are reading, I think, because they're, they're home, they're, there's, <laughs> I'm gonna give you an old head, different answer. Being 60, I have worked in the, uh, I am a member of the Writers Guild of America. And I think I was the seventh black woman to be vested way back. The difference is writing a screenplay is a 12 week deal. Writing a book is three years, six years. You don't write books to create content if you're the three of us. You write books because you, it's something important to do that you care about profoundly, that you would do whether or not anyone paid you for, I think. But, those but are these the books become content, I think, in some yeah, ways. No, but I'm just saying, but I think that's saying. the point. That's, uh, that's the yeah. point that but, I was making. Yeah. But I think that when you're writing, I have written movies, because it was 12 weeks of my life, just for the money, and very happy about it. And they were some very wonderful projects, I won't name, because I won't just write anything by any stretch of imagination. Right. I have worked, um, I worked, for example, on um, Drafts of Their Eyes Were Watching God, which I love for mm -hmm. her book. I love that book already. I would have probably, but it's completely, so I just think that books, poetry books, memoirs, there are, that it's a little bit of a different structure when you are taking a year, two, three, four, five years of your life, six years of your life. Um, in the case of Black Bot, you don't do those things for hire. You do them, I think, largely for passion and for something else. And I think that, and I think that um, I, I'm very much interested in television and film, um, but I just don't, I think they're, they're two different things. I'm very interested because television and film are collaborative arts. There are many, many people working on a tele, it's an opera and that's what its beauty is. And that's what I do think that's exciting about it. It's many, many people coming together to create a truth. Whereas writing a poem, writing a novel, is a, is, a, is a lonely business. They are very different things. But there have been people working in those forms for the last handful of years, probably waiting for someone to say, what do, do you, you have? 
And now yes. I, I believe there are more people and we've seen changes in the publishing industry in terms of who's, who is now like leading different um, presses. So I think there will be more people saying, what do you have? Let me read it. Yeah. Let's see. No. And there's people more yeah. like, there are more of these people who look like us, who mm -hmm. also want to have these collaborations, which I think is really, is, is a positive. Well, we may be going into an actual golden era. That, but that was, because I thought his question was about Mark, of who gets to acquire and what they understand. That right. could be a very different golden era. Okay, so uh, we're going to go on to our next question, which is okay. from uh, Joanne Gavin. Hello, everybody. Hello. Let me tell you how amazing it is to be in the midst of such powerful women. You know, you mentioned Tracy uh, Gwendolyn Brooks. She has been, for me, a model and a mentor. And I remember, of course, those wonderful lines. This is the urgency, live, conduct your blooming in the noise of the whirlwind. And we do see that whirlwind. Every time we see Black Lives Matter marches, these young people putting their lives on the line to talk about what it means to be human in this country, what it means to be human in the world. And I was thinking, I was very moved by what you said about this time causing a kind of change in the way you approach your writing. I know that uh, what um, Alice said about the balance between life and death, how do you balance life with death? Because I've been dealing with that quite a bit these days in terms of the losses that I've had in my own family. But I just want to raise uh, a few names and then ask a question. Uh, the name of Naomi Long Magic from Detroit, who just passed away, who was spent her life uh, working to promote young poets, emerging poets. And of course, Lucille Clifton, Margaret Walker, along with Gwendolyn Brooks. What I want to know is in this day, in this political environment, where out of this election, we've had elevated the first woman to be a black woman to be vice president of this country and to see all of the other women in political places like Stacey Abrams and the mayors in many of these cities, Atlanta, um, Washington, D.C., Baton Rouge, all of these places rising to power. Who are the powerful figures that have helped you to form your own sense of identity and those people you put in your work? I love that question. I want to like take it in and kind of like think. Um, I hear myself listening um, to quiet moments in Langston Hughes lately, like voices, um, you know, of, of regular people talking about their everyday needs and wishes um, and joy. Um, I hear myself wanting to invite that sense of um, honesty and rapture into the work that I'm thinking about, even in a moment that um, doesn't feel ordinary. Um, I, I, I think this is probably like the third time I've mentioned Lucille Clifton, but I feel like I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to connect to her. <laughs> um, we have foxes in our in our neighborhood and I see them and I think, oh, maybe this is her, maybe she can, she can help me. Um, yeah. Because I feel like her vision is cosmic. And even when she's talking about the private, the individual, um, she's talking about the cosmic stakes of being human and what we, what we will be judged by for everything we do and don't do. Um, we need that kind. I, 
I want to be accountable to that perspective as a, as a person and as a writer. Um, I want to know who else um, you two are thinking about. I want to jump on that one because I like your question. You mentioned Margaret Walker and you just mentioned Langston Hughes. And I was honestly thinking in some ways, one of the people who has inspired me the most during this is a woman called Alberta Johnson. And she makes an appearance in the Langston Hughes poems, Alberta Johnson, Madam, the Madam poem. <laughs> yeah. But I actually spent six months in Alberta Johnson's house on bed rest when I was pregnant with my first child. And I got to type on Langston Hughes's typewriter because she had inherited that. Her husband was Langston's literary executive, Arna Bontemps. But Alberta Johnson Bontemps in her own right was an amazing poet and most people don't know that. She only published about four or five poems because she was busy, she had six babies. She knew Zora directly. I lived in that house and she told me stories. I, it was just the two of us alone for six months and she so wanted me to have a life she couldn't have. She died at 97 years old. She mm. had cooked for Arna and cooked for Langston and cooked for Zora. Margaret Atwood, I mean, Margaret um, Walker loved her and came to visit her up until Margaret Walker died. But she wanted me to have the writing life that she didn't have, including being able to be a mother and a woman and a friend in the world. I didn't, I don't have a graduate degree. I didn't start as, I started off as a, family-centered writer. I raised a family first and did traditional women things that I wished to do and reform them, and do, including divorcing. And she supported me when I divorced her grandson. She said, right is right and wrong is wrong. <laughs> we women have to stand together. <laughs> and when he turned into a conservative Republican, she knew I needed to divorce my husband, first husband for political reasons, and I did. And she stood with me. So I think of Grandma Bontemps, who didn't publish until she was in, I believe, really start in her late 70s, 80s, some, I was, but wrote and thought and kept notes and cooked and got up and did all those everyday things and buried children and kept. She was the scaffold, as she called herself. Wow. Wow. So I think of that, I'm proud of having a every, I'm a mother, a friend, a relative first. I'm a, I love being a writer, but it's this, is you, this lived experience. We're on planet earth to be people together. When you talk about that, you make me think of um, Audre Lorde too. Yes. And the way that yes. the woman power becomes a force and the way that the anger that lives in that also gets channeled into in intense clarity and focus. Right. So our, our last question, uh, it comes from Dennis Cohen. Here you go. Hi, everybody. Um, you, you, you three are so, so, so wonderful. I've, um, I've been listening to this and, and, um, I know it's it's funny. I'm happily married, and I have a crush on on you three so hard right now. <laughs> it's uh, it's a little devastating. Um, I'm looking up now. Um, I know Alice. Alice is Alice is a, a a pal of mine. She's she's awesome, and I'm so blown away um, by by you three. I have a, a number of questions, but I think I'm going to ask a. a one of those fan fanboy questions that I hate when people ask me. So I'm like, oh, good, I get to ask somebody else. Um, and um, and it's been a heavy conversation. So I'm like, let me ask something that's like a little different. And you kind of touched on it, but what would, and you can each, three of you can answer this. What would you guys be doing if you weren't writers? Someone asked me like, if I wasn't an artist, what I would be doing, like, where, where would I see myself? in life and it was hard because I'd never seen myself as anything else but what I'm doing. So I think I can put it to to uh, you three. What would you be doing if you weren't writing? Can you imagine a life that you weren't doing this, that you're doing now? Um, and what would it be? Was there another path that you were on before you just decided to, to be a writer or is it something that you've always, you've always wanted to do? Um. I, my light is just going insane, so sorry. <laughs> um, 
every time I see myself, it looks different. I, um, I think I found recently my high school yearbook and it said psychiatrist. Ah. <laughs> I, 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 I had completely forgotten that I, that I had that in mind, but I did go to a high school, Clara Barton High School for the health professions. So I would have been in the, I guess, in the health professions if I weren't um, writing. This is crazy. I arrived at Harvard thinking I'd be a psychiatrist. I took a class in Shakespeare and it changed it completely. But if I wasn't doing this, I would be a political organizer. I'm fangirl crushing woman crushing on Stacey Abrams. I mean, I like I, ready to reinvent myself. I, start, I did some of that when I was younger and I, I think we're working the other end of the street with our novels and poetry, but I'd be out in the street. Yep. Mm -hmm. mm, um, I, I, this was never a goal of mine, um, but the older I get and the more interested I become in questions of faith and being and eternity, I think, oh, in another life, I would love to go to divinity school or, you know, even see what it would feel like to, to write sermons or something like that. Um, but I think poetry is, is <laughs> proximate to that in a way. So I wanted to follow up with this and say, you know, what's much of what we've been talking about is the archive and how we have an archive uh, in books, in the street, in our communities that feeds our work. And I just wondered if anybody had anything specific maybe to talk about using, okay. for example, the History Makers Digital Archive or any of the other archives that are now available uh, through this digital platform that allow the past to, to be more accessible perhaps, especially during COVID, when it's of course very difficult to visit um, primary source collections. I would love to jump in on that and say, when I invented the Black Bottom States novel and the form of that in a, Saints Day book, it was partially as an homage specifically to the History Makers Archive, which is a collection of lives, and to focus on the power of one life told singly, but in community contextualized by other lives. And how I most excitingly imagine my readers is that they finish with my profile, Ziggy's profile of Eartha Kitt, and then they go find Eartha Kitt in the archive, and she's in so many of the stories or Ethel Waters. We have our Ethel Waters, but until you have heard Eartha Kitt tell the story of cooking collard greens for Ethel Waters and learning to eat them out of the pot as a spiritual practice, she takes you to church in that story in a way that actually made me cry just this morning. And I've seen it before. Mm -hmm to follow these characters, the Black Bottom Saints, into the archives and find these Lynette Dobbins Taylor, first woman to ever dance with a Black woman, to dance with the American president at an inauguration, Lynette Dobbins Taylor. She doesn't get the credit, but she and her husband coined the phrase affirmative action. She appears in profound ways in this archive. Someone's describing having her as their principal and how she influenced them. So I love the way the archive can dance with other fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. You could actually interrogate Gwendolyn Brooks' poems with the archives, looking up. I've had students do this, bean eating, looking up be, uh, literally different parts of black, of black culinary culture that is captured or um, pool hall scenes, amazing things in pool halls in this archive. So I love the idea of the archive dancing with artistic creations, novels, films, sculpture, all kinds of art. And I think it's very exciting when we get that. Yeah, I agree with that. I feel like I, I've been turning to history and, and archival uh, records and, and documents as a way of um, trying to figure out what can be useful to this moment that we're living in, what we've gotten wrong because we haven't listened to it closely enough. 
Um, one of my favorite new books is Eve L. Ewing's 1919, which um, takes the 1922 report, The Negro in Chicago, about the 1919 Chicago race riot and explores many different aspects of that story and the report um, in poems that are thinking in very private, subjective terms, broad, collective, um, really surprising formal formal um, approaches. One of the poems in that book is called At the Summit, and it's thinking about Northern migration, but through the metaphor of climbing something like Mount Everest, where um, even the fact of what you're heading toward might actually still kill you because the climate is that unfriendly, un, un, um, unsafe. Um, so I love what, what we are doing um, in terms of making use of, of these materials and asking them new questions and asking them to illuminate new possibilities for us. I, I love the idea of archives as some, obviously something that will outlast us and, and also the archive as a space of finding out people's processes to see like my favorite thing to see in archives are different steps in a manuscript for a writer, for example, like to yeah. see a first draft and how that is different from the final thing. Um, just to see a process happening and in, in, in a way that allows you to go back um, with someone um, is, is something I think I, I find very powerful or to hold like, you know, in Tazaki's uh, archives or at Barnard, um, with both our alma mater and to be able to hold one of those objects almost feels uh, sacred <laughs> in an archive. So, so for me, that's it's really a powerful encounter with with someone and and all the spirit that's invested in certain items, including the, the like the initial vert draft of a work. Yes, I like what you're saying about that. Uh, the archive outlives us, and I guess with that in mind, are any of you thinking of where you're going to put your materials uh, moving forward in terms of repositories, places? I mean, we obviously have a number of different options these days, unlike say, you know, you know, 50, 60 years ago, but where, where might, you know, has anyone thought about that? Where, where, where do you begin to cite your materials so that others can come behind and build on what you've accomplished. My papers are um, housed at Emory in the Rose Library. Um, that feels like a sacred space to me. Lucille Clifton's papers are there. Um, she was my teacher. Seamus Heaney's papers are there. He was my teacher. Kevin Young's papers are there. He was a peer who inspired me to want to become a poet when we were both undergrads. Um, and it's a living space where you see people in there, sleeves pushed up using the materials, um, which is so different from what some spaces um, with rare things feels like, feel like. Well, mine are, I love that. And I will say when Kevin Young was there at Emory, he bought something from me, from Grandma <laughs> Bonkow's piano badge. Oh, <laughs> wow. But um, mine are at Schlesinger uh, two years ago when I, when I was waiting from some uh, test results and didn't know how long I would be living or not, I, uh, something I've been asking, and I first started, I was an undergraduate that loved cutting the pages of a book open when I knew it was the only copy. I was the only person that read that book. So to me, that was a living archive and who went in right before me and made up my mind, Angela Davis. So, you know, two Alabama women and, uh, I do do a lot with food and culinary. And so Julia Child is there, but Angela Davis, I followed her right into the Schlesinger Library and I'd spent you know, months and months and months there. And Kimby Phillips, who's an African-American woman, curator of race and ethnicity there, was a key. Until they had Kimby, that would not probably have been the place for me. And I um, have to call out that she was there. She's Howard educated. Her understanding, it meant a lot to me. And uh, so I, it's, it's wonderful to have your papers at a place where they will give inspiration to someone else down the road because I know papers before that I love. I've, even in high school and college, I was a person who had a card at the Library of Congress 
And I loved to go to the Library of Congress and spent days randomly taking out from archives and reading and reading. That's how I would spend my Christmas vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I feel way behind here because <laughs> my papers are in boxes scattered all around my house and I live in a hurricane zone. So I, so I have to get myself together. Um, but yeah, um, I'm, you know, I'm definitely looking at my alma mater or other, you know, there are places in Brooklyn that were, you know, very helpful to me as well. So but I have not even gone through that whole process of organizing, but this, this has definitely inspired me to, to start trying you know, to open those boxes and see what's there. <laughs> yes, I think that's important because it's almost like a certain moment of self-valuation to think about your work as being archival of needing to be in a certain space at a certain time to be preserved. You know, I think that's a moment of uh, kind of a clarity. And um, it's so wonderful that we now have places that will, will, will eagerly come for our work and also that won't just put it up on the shelf and leave it there, which has been, you know, also something that at times has happened. Anyway, I want to thank you so much for this insightful, but also moving. I think this has been a, such a moving conversation where it really does show how much writers are really the Renaissance people of our contemporary life. They are the historians. I mean, you guys are the historians. You're the sort of moral authority that comes through. Your writing, but also the comments here are just so important for people to hear in this troubling time because as a friend of mine said, there's always been troubling times for black people. So there's a tremendous set of recipes and uh, technologies and epistemologies that exist in the archive for us to rely on. And they, what you're producing will inspire and anchor and support those who come after. So I just really appreciate you and uh, hope that you can keep on keeping on, right? Because that's a big part of this. A big part of the, the, the madness of this time is almost that the burdens get so heavy that it wants to make us stop. And uh, that's the thing that I think we have to most resist and reach out to others like us to be uh, armored against that and to keep on producing these wonderful texts, which I believe we're on the midst really of a second uh, renaissance of black arts in America, uh, roughly around a hundred years after the first. So uh, keep on and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks to everyone. Amazing what, a, work. what a joy this has been. Yeah, this was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.